morning. Welcome to <coughs> Provo Community Congregation of the United Church of Christ. Glad that you are here today. This is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany. And the roof is almost completely done. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I don't know what else they have left, but it's not very much. And we apologize for all the grit that, uh, that you may find in different parts of the uh, church buildings. All these uh, skylights have been redone, and I am so glad that the uh, intoxicating uh, leftover of the epoxy glue has evaporated uh, from the building. Uh, and all the same thing over there. Uh, and so there might be a little grit on that part of the building. So again, our apologies to you for that. If you're visiting with us, so we're really glad that you're here. Uh, we have some special friends from Illinois that uh, have come down to uh, do something that is near and dear to me. Uh, a, a young woman, a soccer player, has been having some concussions due to the nonviolent aspect of soccer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were sharing some of, our, some of our stories. I'm so glad. I didn't catch your name, and, and I don't think I even asked. Emily. Emily? Yes. May, may we include you in our prayers? Thank you. They're from uh, the middle of Illinois, and if you want to have some fun with someone who's from Illinois, go up and ask them about Illinois, <laughs> so that you can hear what we all hear when we step into that arena of joy. There's only one. So anyway, that's Emily and her mother. We're so glad that they are here. Thank you uh, for coming. I have to write that down because my short-term memory isn't what it used to be in my It's a little insight. Confessing. Joke. Terminology. Okay, enough of that. Um, I call your attention to <coughs> the fact that uh, today following the service, we have our annual church meeting. And um, I now I invite you to look at the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, the Keeping the Faith of Downtown Provo. Uh, this church is a community cornerstone and we are in a restoration project campaign that has been created to preserve Provo history and raise funding to repair, restore, and renovate while we expand this beautiful and historic community cornerstone to help the church remain an open and affirming faith organization and to continue and grow as one of the only places for secular community gatherings in downtown Provo. To find out more and donate, we invite you to go to the website and find, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Announcement number two. Utah Valley Interstate Interfaith Choir rehearsals begin today. Um, it will begin at 445. The choir is open to 16 years of age and older with mu musical experiences. Rehearsals are weekly on Sundays in the Fellowship Hall with refreshments afterwards. Ah, we've moved from light, light uh, supper to refreshments. Good for us. Performances throughout the year uh, and small, a small material fee is required. Today, 445. I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. Some of us are losing our voices and can no longer sing like we once could if we can sing at all and we love to listen to the beautiful melodies provided by the choir and it's, it's exceptional uh, maestro, our organist, David Lewis. Uh, annual, annual congregational meeting, we mentioned a rummage sale uh, to help raise money for the church operations. We're collecting usable items for an upcoming rummage sale on March 11th and 12th. Brett Pope, you want to wave your hand? Thank you. Uh, is in charge. And the assistance is needed to help with the operational costs of the church, including keeping the utilities paid, insurance current, and other operational needs. Code, keep the lights on. Uh, use the QR code, which is just right next door, should you want to be to take care of the trans action online. You can also use the offering, it's at the entrance to the nave, and all donations are appreciative. All right, are there other announcements? 
God's people. Today is, as we said, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, following the Epiphany. Our theme for Epiphany is Love Never Ends. Today we focus on 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest of these is love. I invite you during uh, the next few moments to join uh, in reading along with me as I read aloud the words of gathering. As we worship, let us sing about loving. Let us pray to be more loving. Let us hear stories of powerful and transforming love, all with the intention of shaping our everyday lives along the pattern Paul described in 1 Corinthians 13. Our hymn is number 575, O oh, for a world you are invited to remain seated as we sing. According to Jesus, we are to love God and our neighbor as we love ourselves. If we confess our sin, Jesus is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Lord, love is patient and kind and we have been envious, boastful, arrogant, and rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And we have rejoiced when others are resented, given their comeuppance and embarrassed to tears. Love rejoices in the truth. And yet we tell partial truth and flat out lie, claiming we are telling the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Yet what do children know of such things? Lord, we speak of love. Teach us to love. Amen. 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 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is the giver. Christ is the gift. God's gift was love. Christ's gift is forgiveness. Today we proclaim the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is number 433. In the bulb there's a flower. I invite you to remain seated. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels that do not have love, I'm an Aussie gong or climbing symbol. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, if I have all faith, Faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I have nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love. If you were to read this in Greek, the word is agape, not eros, not 
not fear. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never leads a body to the edge of the cliff that they might fall off and fall off. Love never fails. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. For tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away childish things and put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. The greatest of these is love. How many weddings have you gone to and had these words read, or parts of them read? How many times have we had the privilege of hearing these words, reading these words, turning to these words? To hear them anew and to hear them fresh, invites us to center upon the fact that love never ends, and invites us to consider why. At the end of chapter 12, Paul says, I want to show you a more excellent way. In the church in Corinth, there was people who had means and people who had no means. There were people who did not understand the poverty of their wealth and those who did not understand the wealth of their poverty. There was, there was dissension. There were those who thought that they, because of their status or because of the types of gifts, spiritual gifts that they had, such as speaking in tongues, which they considered the top one on the list, Within, within that, they, were, they, they knew better and they, they pressured those who were less than they, who had less important gifts, who had no money to support, who very, could bring very little in the way to, of, a, of a, a dish to a fellowship supper. They could tell them how it should be done. It was common in society, just as it's common today. Those who have, love to tell those who have not. And those who have not, love to be rebellious. And make life very difficult for the hoity toys. There is a more excellent way, Paul says, than this dissension within the church. We are the body Christ. What is this more excellent way then? And why should we even be interested in it? But being the church, says Paul, we are the body of Christ. And when the world looks at us, when we look at each other, and if we cannot see Christ, then what's it all about, Alfie? Paul has been talking about giftedness and unity as he addresses the disunity of the church. There is division in the body. Whether we want to talk about the body of Christ, whether we want to talk about it in the church, or whether we want to talk about it in the body of politics, or in human community, or even in our families, there is division that is constantly inviting us to embrace it. Paul sets out to address that division 
Not by calling names or by pointing fingers. Paul doesn't add fuel to the fire by talking about who is in the wrong and who is in the right. And neither should we. So what does Paul talk about? He talks about love. 1 Corinthians 13 is an invitation to step back from judging others, from being harsh on others, to seeing the flaws in others, not that that's wrong if it's offered with redemption, but it is nothing right about it if it does not offer redemption and reconciliation. At least that seems to be Paul's position. And so therefore, it's about reframing, about breathing, about claiming the gift that Christ came to give. A new commandment I give you, he said in the Gospel of John, love one another as I have loved you. You don't have to earn God's love. God is present to you and is loving you, and in that love, love. To rephrase, it's not about reframing, it's, it's about breathing, it's about claiming the gift that Christ came to give. It's about salvation. It's about forgiveness. It's about redemption. It's about reconciliation. This thing called love. Too often we talk about salvation primarily in terms of what we're saved from. From sin, from condemnation, from an eternity of frustration and suffering. And sometimes we talk about salvation in terms of what it's going to do for us. What's, what's in the future? We talk about it as, as someday in heaven, or the coming of the kingdom, or all that is to come. It gives wonderful memories of, of a place where there, there is no dissension, a place where there is no differences, where a place, place where there is no tears, there is no heartache, there is no pain. And most of us already know how to achieve that, and that's just if you'll do whatever I want you to do, then my life will be joyous. I suggest that 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a different answer to what are we saved for. I suggest that the answer that Paul gives is that we are saved to love. We are set free to love. We are empowered, equipped, enabled to love. That's what it means to be saved. Saved from not loving. Saved for loving. So why are we so willing to, to embrace death as opposed to life? Why are we so willing to accept, con uh, embrace condemnation as opposed to salvation? Why are we so unwilling to love, to forgive, to care? Following our choice to accept God's invitation, God's invitation of forgiveness and redemption and renewal, in God's grace, Following our choice to accept, we gladly put on the garments. We gladly put on the behavior. We gladly put on the power of God's love, mercy, compassion, and grace as shown to us through Jesus Christ. By saying yes, we put on the clothes and dress ourselves in behaviors and attitude of salvation as offered us through Jesus. His life, his teachings, his ministry, his service, his passion, his death, and his resurrection were our example. Like the early disciples, we were hungry to follow and to do. But then, it got tough. There's Calvary. That cross is waiting for someone to be put on it so that that someone can say to the world, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Who's ready to go? And almost everyone who has been approached by God in Holy Writ from the beginning of time has found excuses not to go. Everyone. Some decided they would. Mary, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, to name a few. By saying yes, we put on the clothes and we addressed ourselves in the behaviors and attitudes of salvation, yet old habits die hard and continually we are reminded that obstinate habits 
do not go away or disappear until they are replaced with new habits. And dear friends, new habits must be used and practiced with diligence even when we don't recognize their importance. My dear friend Betty Ann was talking about the fact that when she got an allowance when she was a child, talking about her Sunday school, she got an allowance from child and her parents required her to tithe. She did not like the last part of the gift. She loved the allowance. How long do we tithe with in, in misery and contempt before it becomes a joy? I don't know, but however long it takes, that's what we do. Don't we? Old habits die hard. Indeed it was and is a wonderful moment when forgiveness floods our hearts and souls, when grace washes over us, when our hearts hear that the day you will be with me in paradise. Ha! Ah, there's a place for me in the presence of God, yet almost immediately we find it difficult to forgive ourselves and even more difficult to forgive another. So I ask, I ask that if we cannot forgive ourselves, how are we able to forgive another? And I suggest that we most certainly will not be able to forgive another unless we forgive ourselves, and yet we are on a fool's errand. Many times, when we are told that we must forgive others even if we cannot forgive ourselves. We must love others even if we cannot love ourselves. And if we attempt to forgive another without being able to forgive ourselves, if we attempt to love another as we cannot, as we cannot love ourselves, I suggest that forgiveness that we have experienced from God eventually will be replaced by bitterness, acrimony and harsh judgment aimed at condemning all who fall short and as we condemn the other to bitterness and strife we ourselves are fated to be condemned to none other than bitterness and strife is it possible is it probable that then the old habit of judgment without redemption will be taken over will take us over until once again, by God's amazing grace, God's amazing love, compassion, and forgiveness will somehow penetrate our rage, inviting us once again to realize that unless the old is replaced by the new and takes over and replaces the old as well as continue to fight against God, as we did the same thing. Let me go over that one more time. I suggest that it, if we don't allow the light to enter our darkness, then we will fight against God as the Sanhedrin fought against Jesus. Convinced that Jesus was a heretic, convinced that Jesus had nothing to do with God and therefore had to be eliminated. And we become the enemies of God. And we become committed to ridding the world of something called love, forgiveness, reconciliation, compassion. And incredibly, we resist receiving it. Even though it's what we long most Paul seems to be clear that when and only when we replace judgment with or balance judgment with forgiveness, that love will win the day. I suggest that if it takes saying over and over, a thousand times over, the words of forgiveness until forgiveness is spoken from the heart and soul, that the discipline of practice will then mysteriously transform from having to say it, thinking to say it, needing to say it, into words of saying, I'm speaking from the heart, I'm speaking from the soul. It's no more duty and obligation. 
It becomes the very essence of life, Zoe. Life as God understands it. It is then that we are assured, deep within our being, that we are no longer fighting against God, but we are fighting with and for God to save the world. How many times might we ask the Lord, how many times, Lord, do we need to look into the face of the enemy, of the person or institutions who have taken away life from us, inflicted physical, emotional, social, spiritual, volitional, and mental pain? How long will we look at insiders who invite us in but never show us the door? I suggest that Paul suggests that until we are able to tell them that we love and forgive them. Tell them that we'll climb Calvary for them. Indeed, it's a beautiful sentiment. I suggest that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yet I suggest that when we realize of what God has done for us, that we gain the capacity and the courage and the strength to do for them as God, through Christ, has done for us. And with joy, we take the first steps as we walk the day where Jesus walked. What's that you say? Forgive them? For they don't know what they do? That's what we need to say? As many times as it takes until love becomes forgiveness and forgiveness becomes love, even greater love, and no matter how long the journey to freedom and forgiveness takes, each step of the way the Spirit of God is by our side, do we dare walk the day of Jesus Christ? Paul writes these words. If I speak in the tongues of men, mortals, and angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over all, even my body, so that it may that I may boast, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. It's not envious, boastful, or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This love never fails, never ends, never throws us under the bus. Prophecies, they'll come to an end. Tongues, they will cease. Knowledge, it too will come to an end. For we know only in part. And we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away and put an end to childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now we will know only in part then we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. Now faith, hope, love, abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. In the name of the Father, Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Amen.
They retire during that. Thank you. No matter how close. To perfection, no matter how close I get to actually loving as God has loved me. Recognizing how far I am from such grace and mercy. Every time I hear that, and especially it's played by my Lewis, I just see Jesus. Like the angel in the back of the hands. Come home. You who are weary, come home. Whom shall we pray for this day? My brother, who's home from the hospital now, but still needs prayer. His name is Leland. Any word on Alfred? Well, we went Sunday and all the decisions changed. Responded to several orders. Some of the several signs and responded. So we, we were going to a movement like this for us last Sunday. Thank you. Oh. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, how often does selfishness wash through our good intentions? How often do we speak bold, sophisticated words to impress others? How often do we forget that we are what we are because of you? Remind us, Lord, that our abilities are your gifts to us. Remind us, Lord, that you loaned us some possession in hope that we would, in the hope that we would help others. Lord, when we are guilty of living only to impress others, thank you for your forgiveness. When we gain status only by putting someone else down, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. When we do things only for applause, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. And if all that we do sounds like nothing more than clanging cymbals and noisy gongs to you, thank you for calling to us to come home. Thank you for humility. Thank you for contrition. Thank you for the privilege of being humble enough to serve humble enough to pray, humble enough to love, even when people never say thank you. Thank you for calling us to faith, hope, and love. We celebrate with the Brown family, especially with our brother Alfred, Seemingly at the end, and yet, miraculously, by your grace, something moved. Oh, Lord, we pray for his healing and his restoration. Even as we pray for the family, who both celebrates and still looks great difficulty in the eye. We pray for our new friend, Emily, as she undergoes tests for her cognitive memory. Oh, Lord, after 50 years, hopefully they have found ways to help that. And even as a miracle happens there, we look down the road to where it will happen even more spontaneously. We pray for the examination for her treatment and for her healing. 
We pray for Betty Ann's brother Leland, home from the hospital, still a ways to go. We pray for Eva, Eva and Paul Tippetts, who have recovered from COVID. We pray for Peter Johnson with bronchitis. We pray for our families, our faith communities, our friends, for the ability to discover our great wealth amidst our great poverty and our great poverty amidst our great wealth. We pray for Marilyn Pope, for Sherry, for Cinda, for Cindy, for Ms. Lewis, those infected with COVID. We pray for Garrett and Sarah Pope, for keeping the faith in downtown Provo, for the schedule of events here at PCC, for our congregational meeting that is about to convene. And Lord, we pray for our local, national, state, and world leaders. We pray for the desires of our hearts as well as those persons and those situations known only to our hearts. And we pray with assurance and confidence. For we pray in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, who himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us in the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of reflection and is hymn number, number 208, God Love the World. Should you choose, I invite you to stand. And I also invite you to remain standing for the benediction our hymn is 208, God Loved the World.